Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you all are in the world. We are super excited um, that you have decided to spend your evening with us or your morning or afternoon learning about the first year experience. If you are coming to join us after our series of conversations, whether it was through our financial aid, um, understanding an overview last night, or our official welcome um, to the class of 2028 last week virtually, um, we welcome you, you know, into this space. We know that many of you are current high school seniors who are navigating the spring semester. And again, I want to reiterate, we thank you for giving your time here. And we also understand that for some some reason that you need to depart early um, or if you need to come back and refer back to some information tonight's session is recorded for you so after today you will receive an email from us with this recording it will be, will be accessible to you and we also encourage you to check your application portal um, to be able to access this information as well and of course, we also want to hear from you. We have a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to hear from wonderful um, colleagues um, regarding the first year experience. And we want to hear your questions. So at the bottom of your screen or on your phone, please take a look at our Q&A feature here. We are will be responding here in the background, um, but also live. Um, so if you have any questions related to any of the content that will be shared this evening, um, please know that you are welcome to share that information there. And of course, last but not least, this is not the last session that we will be hosting in a virtual format. Um, we will be hosting a series of other events virtually and in person for admitted students. And we'll make sure that you have that link um, provided to you at the end of today's session. But just as a reminder, it is all available to you in your application portal. Um, but without further ado, I would love to introduce uh, my wonderful colleague, um, Dr. Rachel Roldell, who is the director of the First Year Experience. Thanks, Janessa, and welcome, everyone. As Janessa said, I'm the director of the First Year Experience, and I'm also a faculty member as a professor of mathematics here at Skidmore. So the focus of tonight is to talk, as Janessa said, about the First Year Experience. We're going to give you a little bit of background information, and then we'll open up the floor for you to have questions, and, and we'll give some answers to those, those questions. I'm joined today by my colleague, Ryan Holmesy, who's the director of academic advising and Francie Wharton from the class of 2025. Francie is a former student of mine from fall 2021 calculus, and then she was also my peer mentor for my Scribner seminar in fall of 2022. So as I said, I wanna just give you a little bit of background information. So the general structure is that all students are required to take a first year seminar. We call them a Scribner seminar in honor of Lucy, Scribner, Sk Lucy Skidmore Scribner. This is an interdisciplinary academic course that's often rooted in a faculty member's home field or area of interest. So for example, my course is entitled The Dynamics of Chaos. So it explores mathematics as well as interdisciplinary connections of chaos theory to physics, to other areas of science, but also its presence in pop culture, in movies, in art, and, and various other forms. So it's seminar, and Francie will talk about her seminar here in a few minutes, but the focus of all seminars is a common set of learning goals. So regardless of the specific content, all seminars will address some of these academic learning goals. So talking about writing, talking about speaking, talking about using critical evidence and, and being able to support your, your ideas with background research, et cetera. So in addition to the Scribner seminar, students will take three other academic courses. And so those academic courses might be related to students' major area of interest or potential major area of interest, could be related to interests that they had in high school, and oftentimes are related to interests that are just emerging and maybe they haven't had an opportunity to study yet. So we really encourage exploration across the whole curriculum. So as I mentioned, the Scribner Seminar is required. It's part of the all college requirement that students must fulfill. And they fulfill that in the first semester, but some of the other coursework might address some of those other all college requirements that typically speaking, students have, with, with the exception of a few that come up sooner, have all four years to address those. The Scribner Seminar also serves the purpose of helping students transition to college. 
So it is an academic course. It is, a, I should say, a robust academic course that will challenge students to think critically, but it's also going to cover and support some of that psychosocial programming, as well as introduce students to policies and practices here at Skidmore campus. And so each section will have a peer mentor, and Francie will talk a little bit more about that role shortly. But as I said, in fall of 2022, Francie was the peer mentor for my section of, of Dynamics of Chaos, and so helped facilitate transition and ad adaptation of my students to all aspects of, of Skidmore life. So that's kind of a rough overview of our program, certainly open to talking in more detail, but I want to turn now to the other two panelists and ask them a few questions and have them give a little bit more background about themselves. So I'm going to start with Francie, and Francie, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and also describe your first year seminar that you took now a couple of years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Francie Wharton. I'm a physics major and minor here at Skidmore. And uh, like Professor Rodale mentioned, I was a peer mentor in the past. Um, during my first semester, I took a Scribner seminar called In the Lab and on the Screen, taught by Dr. Leah Ball from the chemistry department. Excuse me. Um, and that was a really great class. It basically focused on the science behind all of your favorite science fiction movies and TV shows. Um, so we covered a wide range of topics, including AI, space, uh, environmental issues, uh, geoscience, um, uh, genetics. And so we watched all of these different movies. Uh, we watched, uh, let's see, Jurassic Park. We ended up watching um, the HBO series Chernobyl. Uh, we watched uh, Gattaca, um, we watched uh, Gravity together, and so that was a really great opportunity to bond with fellow classmates as we watched the movies together, and then we also got to read all these fantastic articles about um, what the science, if the science that happened in the movie was actually real or not. Um, and so it really allowed us to tap into lots of different areas. Like we did a lot of literary analysis work through the films we were watching, the books we were reading alongside the films. Um, obviously we learned a little bit of science along the way uh, to kind of do a Mythbusters real or not real for the uh, options for the movies we were watching. Um, and then also uh, did a lot of different research projects too, which is really great. Um, one thing I really loved about my seminar was that it really taught me how to use all of the resources in the library on campus um, and all of the databases that you have available to you as a freshman. Um, so that was really awesome to get that real wide range of skills from one class. Can you talk a little bit about the other courses that you took your first semester? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so during the summer before your first year, uh, you're, you make your first choice of classes, which is your Scrimner seminar. Um, and once you, you rank all of your choices in a list from one to 10, the Ox usually tries to give you one of your first uh, three or four, number three or four options. Um, and from there, you get assigned your first advisor. So the professor who teaches your Scribner seminar is the first advisor you have at Skidmore. Um, here at Skidmore, you don't need to declare a major until the end of your sophomore year. So every student comes in undeclared with their advisor being their Scribner seminar professor. So that professor reaches out to you over the summer then and helps you pick the other classes that you want to take. So um, I ended up talking with my professor and deciding because I was interested in physics, I should take uh, physics one. And I also need to take calculus one because that was a co-requisite for physics. Uh, little did I know I would end up actually really enjoying that class. Um, <laughs> and then I also decided to take uh, EN 105. I took a class called Memoirs from the Margins that fulfilled my expository requirement expository writing requirement, which is one of the all college requirements that Dr. Rodale mentioned. Um, and then I'm also a dance minor. So I went a little bit above and ended up taking a ballet class uh, just because I wanted to keep up with that. And that was very doable. The ballet, the dance classes here at Skidmore are a little bit less of a credit load than other classes because um, they involve less homework. So you can always fit in like an extra one or two credit class on top of the three or four uh, classes that Dr. Rodale mentioned. Um, if you're feeling like you want to add that. Great, thanks, Francie. So I'm gonna to turn to Ryan to introduce yourself a little bit more, Ryan, and also talk about the summer advising and the advising process in general that Francie mentioned. Yeah, great, thanks so much. And Francie, I love that you're a physics major and a dance minor. Um, fun fact, I'm also a professional 
ballet dancer. So we have a lot in common there. And I love that that's the kind of thing that students can do here at Skidmore. So um, my background is in higher education administration and specifically advising. And then I have a particular focus in the arts. My other academic um, area of specialty is music theory and composition. And so I just think this is such a special time of our college students' lives. And um, I love guiding students on their really individual, um, individualized paths to graduation and that they can do the kind of things that, that Francie is doing. Um, for the summer advising, which is something that my office oversees, we have a really great program. And it's think, I think it's pretty unique in that all students have an individual advising appointment with a faculty member over the summer. And we have a really cool guide that helps prepare both the faculty advisors and, but especially our students. I um, mean, I'll put that guide, it's the new student advising and registration guide. I'll put that guide into the, um, the link to that guide in the chat window in a moment. And that talks through the process. It's basically going to take place during the month of June. You'll find out who your summer advisor is at the very end of May or the very beginning of June. Then you'll schedule an appointment. That guide also shows the dates of course registration that will open up toward the end of June. <clears throat> and um, our faculty will just get to know you and you'll get to know them. And, and that's a really important part of bridging that gap between your admittance and the start of, of the um, fall semester. Great. Thank you, Ryan. So I, I just want to reiterate some of the points that both Ryan and Francie had mentioned. So in most cases, your summer advisor will be your Scribner seminar professor. Otherwise, there are other faculty members on campus who will also do advising. So regardless of who the summer advisor is, though, once you come to campus in the fall, the Scribner seminar professor will be your academic advisor, and they will be your advisor until you declare your major, which that doesn't happen necessarily until spring of your sophomore year. So Francie, had her faculty member for Scribner Seminar is a chemistry professor. So Professor Ball was her advisor until Francie declared physics. And so that, I just want to go back to Ryan and Francie, and first starting with you, Francie, to just talk a little bit about what, you know, what was your timeline for declaring the physics major and what was that, you know, what influenced your choice and how did you go about declaring your major? Yeah, I mean, I will say I was really unsure what I wanted to do uh, for my major, and Dr. O'Neill has heard this many times, but um, <laughs> I started off being really interested in physics, but honestly, I'm sure if I would be able to do it, I think it had a large stigma of being too difficult, um, and so I was really nervous about that, um, but also on top of that, I had a lot of other interests. I really love English and history, so I considered majoring in that for a while. Um, I took some lovely English and history classes during my first and second years at Skidmore, um, and they almost sold me on it. But I did end up deciding on physics, but I did wait to declare until the end of my sophomore year just because I wanted to give myself the full chance to think about it. But you can declare really early on. You can declare during your second semester at Skidmore if you really want to. And you can also change your major if you make a decision during the beginning, during your second semester, and you decide, you know what, actually, I want to go from being a history major to being a physics major. That's also doable. Um, and your advisor will help you make sure that you'll be able to graduate on time if you're switching majors as well. But um, I kind of shopped around for classes for a long time. I took a variety of classes every semester just because I wanted to get the full experience and see not just what the first intro level of majors was, but also like where that would go eventually. Um, and the more physics classes I took, uh, the more interested I got. Not to say that wasn't the case for other majors, but I really felt like um, doing physics was a really unique experience and I love the department here. Everyone is so friendly and so kind. Um, and I just felt like, you know what, if I'm gonna do it, I'd wanna do it here. And here we are, and I'm about to be a senior. <laughs> Um, but I think that your advisors are really great people to talk to and help you kind of evaluate your interests and how that fits into your major and are always available for conversations. And Francie, I just want to ask you, there's a question that has come through to talk a little bit about your experience as a woman in STEM at, at Skidmore. Can you, do you mind to do that at this time? Yeah, absolutely. I felt really supported as a woman in STEM. I will say in the physics department right now, we have more female professors than we do male. So that is really nice. But also I feel like all of my classmates have been really respectful. 
Um, the All of the women in the physics department have been very, the students and the faculty have been very supportive. I know I have really close relationships with a lot of my peers, um, and that includes a lot of my female peers. Um, I feel like I'm not getting my ideas dismissed in class. I feel like I'm on the same page as my classmates, which I really enjoy. Um, I think overall, I have found science has been more extremely supportive. All of my professors have told me on numerous occasions that all they want is for their students to succeed um, and are willing to help you in any way that they can, whether that means like if you can't make it to their office hours, if they meet with you on Zoom at 9 a.m. because that's the only time you can, or if they stay with you after class to answer any questions you have. Um, I think that everyone's just super supportive and so they're willing to answer any questions help me away and want you to have a great experience here great thank you ryan i want to turn to you to just see for you to follow up on the process of declaring a major both the, the process and the resources that skidmore provides for students yeah definitely so like francie mentioned all students enter the college as undecided or undeclared and that is by design as part of the spirit of the liberal arts college that we are where you're going to both have the breadth and the depth of this undergraduate experience and so um, most students are like francie in the sense that they declare in the fourth semester of their of their time here and that that um second semester of the second year and that actually just happened uh, a couple weeks ago for our rising juniors and um the beauty of that is that it gives students that genuine opportunity to explore a lot of different disciplines because i think as professor um rachel rodale mentioned earlier you know, some students are going to come in with very strong ideas of what they want to study. And then sometimes they'll come in with strong ideas and that will also change. And they're also going to, to get introduced to things that they weren't introduced to in high school. And so this is really the beginning of a journey. I know that there can often be pressure. You might have family members or siblings or just an overarching this pressure in society to like choose a major what is your major and you have to have it all figured out right now but the beauty of this um of this degree program whichever degree program you choose for the choose for the most part is that you have this time to explore and you'll select five academic interests when you complete the fye check checklist that's not declaring a major but it's just expressing an interest in a wide variety of areas and we often have students choose um, biology, but also theater, but also an interest in the health professions, but also um, an interest in, in uh, engineering. So that's not declaring a major, that's just sharing your interests to help form the basis of your advising conversation this summer. And, and then from there, um, it's more like this ongoing process that Francie described. It's taking a course, it's making a connection with an instructor, it's learning this new this new field of study or a new methodological approach or talking to your peers or being involved in a club that sparks an interest in your academic life or having an internship experience so one of the things that i love talking about with students is this very thing and it's an ongoing process of both like academic discovery but also personal discovery so as you learn more about who you are and what what your values are and what your beliefs are and where your interests lie and when you think about the salient parts of your identity then we want to map that onto an educational program and then of course we want to create alignment there between your academic journey and your ongoing academic journey after after college or your your career aspirations so it's an ongoing process um, I should add, though, that in some programs, like the sciences and in sometimes the arts as well, some programs are a bit more sequence based. So you do want to take introductory courses right from the start. So you build that foundation and you work your way through the prerequisites that prepare you for the next level of courses and the next level of courses. Um, but by and large, many of our degree programs can be completed in the two years. Um, You'll probably get started on those in the introductory courses in your first two years, um, but they could be completed in your second two years. Great, thank you. So we're gonna turn now to your questions that, that have been popping up throughout the session so far. And so one of the first ones that there's a nice transition, Ryan, from what you were just talking about to talking about the general ed curriculum. So that's another part of the curriculum that students are working on throughout all of the four years. And as I mentioned, the Scribner Seminar 
is one of the first requirements that students will meet. One of the questions is if that seminar counts towards other requirements, perhaps major requirements or other all college requirements. And it does not because again, it in itself is its own requirement, the Scribner seminar requirement. But most of the other courses that students will take throughout their time at Skidmore either are falling into a major requirement, an all college requirement, or a course that they're just taking based on interest and wanting to explore. So I'm gonna turn now to talk about, there've been a couple of questions about OP. So OP students, OP is a, a program that Skidmore offers and OP students will integrate fully with Skidmore students after the, the summer term. They have a slightly different summer advising process. Ryan, are you able to speak to the summer advising for OP students? Yeah, sure. And actually, it's a great opportunity for me to talk about the advising model overall at the college as well. So every student is assigned to a faculty advisor at all times, but many students, for a variety of different reasons, also have a secondary advisor. So everyone in the OP program will have a secondary advisor who is an OP academic uh, counselor. And You'll meet um, not with your Scribner seminar instructor or another summer advisor but, um, during the summer, but you'll actually meet with an OP advisor during the summer. And they do um, what we all aspire to do as advisors is really give you a holistic kind of uh, approach to talking about your your goals and your interests and in the course selection process. So other than that, and you'll, you'll stay with that person over the course of your four years, which is pretty exciting. Um, Similarly, if you are interested in the health professions, you might have a secondary advisor in health professions. If you're interested in our engineering program or, or our pre-law program, you may have a secondary advisor there. If you um, declare more than one major, you'll also have another advisor for, you'll have an advisor for each major. And then in my area, the Office of Academic Advising, we're a small but mighty team of three um, full-time professional staff advisors. We're available to support this larger faculty-based advising model. So we're available, sort of your typical nine to five operation on Monday through Friday to work with students um, at all levels of academic standing across all programs um, at any phase to help them understand degree requirements, academic policies and procedures, and just to guide them on the way. So we just have a very high level of support. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Francie, I'm going to direct the next question for you. Could you talk a little bit about the social aspects of your first year experience? How were you encouraged to get to know other students? And, and I'm curious if you can respond both, both from your perspective as a first year student, but also from your perspective as a peer mentor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a great part of the uh, first year experience program is that you go through orientation with your cohort of students from your Scribner seminar. Um, so that in itself allows for a great opportunity for you to get to know your classmates, um, to get to know people who have a similar academic interest to you, because a lot of times students will pick their Scribner seminar because it focuses on an area that they're interested in. So when I did my Scribner seminar, all of the students were from a variety of different science backgrounds and in terms of their interests. Um, so we all got to know each other really well through that. Um, and I definitely made a lot of friends through my first year uh, seminar, uh, both at, during orientation afterwards, and then they would introduce me to their network of friends. And from there, everything just grew. Um, I also know that from being a peer mentor, just watching students interact with each other during orientation, um, that's a great opportunity for students to engage with each other. A lot of times students will come early to do a pre-orientation program. We offer a few different pre-orientation programs on campus. Those are not required, completely optional, but give you a great opportunity to get to know um, other students before regular orientation, which is for all students begins. And so that was fun to watch students who had been here for orientation kind of lead the way for students who had just arrived to campus, show them around maybe, introduce them to friends that they had met through their pre-orientation programs and kind of continue to build their social network through that. Um, and I think that overall, the having that experience we were going through orientation with your cohort really solidifies the relationships that you end up having in class. I know from seeing the class I peer mentored for last year and being in a first in a scripter seminar 
everyone became very close with each other. It's hard not to when you're work, taking these classes, which are so interdisciplinary, working on these projects, working on homework together. It's definitely a very social class. Um, I would say almost no, maybe even no Scribner seminars are completely 100% just lecture at you. They're really supposed to design to design to engage students in multiple ways. Um, you're assessed in multiple ways throughout your time in the class. Um, it's really supposed to help you kind of get used to all of the different learning that goes on during college. And I just want to mention, Francie alluded to the Scrivener seminar and the learning environment there. So those seminar, those courses are seminar style. So it is a smaller course, the writing seminar, which typically is fulfilled the writing requirement with EN 105. There are a couple other options that students have, but that's also a seminar style course. So those courses are capped around 15 or 16 students. In general, Skidmore course size can vary from a first year class, which is around 28 to an upper level senior course, which will be around 18 to 20 students. Um, there was a question in the chat about the type of learning environment. So I want to speak as a faculty member and then Francie, if you don't mind answering, and then certainly Ryan, if you have any anything to add. And I would just say that in any given semester, you're going to have a different teaching style in all of your courses because you're going to have a different faculty member. And so we all have different pedagogies that we are trained in. Also, as I alluded to, the Scribner Seminar is a different type of pedagogy than I would use if I'm teaching or when I taught Francie Calculus in a course with 28 students. But we tend to have some level of interactivity in all of the coursework. Um, we have a lot of, of use of technology in, especially in the science and math courses, but less emphasis in some of the humanities courses. Though certainly a lot of our faculty colleagues in various humanities courses are bringing in documentary, bringing in audio, and certainly using multimedia as well. So there really is a big diversity in terms of the style of course. I would also say that in any given semester, and Francie is a great example of this, I see her running across campus from dance class to the physics lab. And so their students are also shifting from different types of learning environments. So engaging in a more artistic environment in one case, and then shifting to a biology lab or a calculus session, computer science, et cetera. So just want to see if Francie and Ryan, if either of you have any comments to add about the, the type of teaching that occurs in the classroom. Well, a small piece that I can add to that is, um, yes, absolutely, that pedagogical style is going to vary from course to course and discipline to discipline. Um, but, in, uh, but by and large, our classes are also just very small. So regardless of the style, um, there's also a pretty um, pretty strong, close connection between faculty and students. So I think that's just a, a, a great point that I want to emphasize. And um, in turn, we really get to know our students really well. We get to know each other very well. And uh, yeah, we don't we don't have courses that have 60, 70, 80 students in them. <laughs> Anything else, Francie, that you, that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, I I think I just have to say I always have really positive feelings associated with my classes. Um, I feel like they're very like friendly and inviting spaces. Um, like a memory that comes to mind was like last year I had uh, my thermodynamics physics class on my birthday, and the one of my classmates told my professor before I came in it was my birthday, and so then he had everyone in the class wish me a happy birthday. Um, <laughs> which was really sweet because I'd had a really long day and it was just like such a human moment and really nice. And it was like, it was like, happy birthday. All right. And now we're going to do thermodynamics. Um, but it was also, I think that class is also a good, uh, a good example of how science classes can be really interactive here at Skidmore. That was by far not a lecture, sit down, learn for a hundred and uh, so minutes. It was, we were doing group work, we were solving problems, the professor was asking questions to the class. And so like, that was really amazing. I think I have rarely taken a class that was just the professor talking at us for the entire class period. Even if that's the professor's 
preferred way of teaching. They always try to engage students through asking questions, through giving real world examples and application problems. Um, I don't find class at Skinmore boring by any means. I think every class that I've taken has been really exciting and interesting. And it's the professors really work hard to make that um, happen. And so I've enjoyed pretty much every class I've taken at Skinmore, I can say. Excellent. Um, I want to go back in time a little bit for you, Francie and Ryan. This is front and center on our, our on our radar moving forward to talk a little bit about placement tests. So Ryan had mentioned the FYE checklist. And if you decide to come to Skidmore, which we hope that you that you will, you'll hear from my office in early May. And part of that introductory re email response will give you some information about what your next steps are. And so we've consolidated those into what we call the FYE checklist. So those are a series of tasks that, that you will do to prepare for arrival on Skidmore. Many of them academic, but some of them social or, or in terms of you know just preparing for a resident's life or life on campus in general, so health forms, et cetera. Um, but one of those sets of tasks involves placement tests. And so, Ryan, I wanted to see if you could speak a little bit about the nature of placement tests, and then maybe, Francie, after Ryan has spoken, if you could talk a little bit about your experience with placement tests. Yes, great. Thanks so much, Rachel. So I just um, was sharing a link right now to the course placement page of the new student advising and registration guide and all students will take the directed self-placement over the summer and that uh, determines what level of course they will be in for uh, in order to satisfy the expository writing requirement uh, and th that's our college writing course and then the other one that all students will do um, in preparation for their summer advising appointment is the quantitative reasoning um, uh, uh, yep, exam, and that is to prepare students to determine what level of applied quantitative reasoning they are in, the AQR. They don't necessarily, uh, students don't necessarily have to register for those courses in their first semester, but the important reason why we ask you to take those placement exams so early is because in some cases, you might take one or even two courses um, in advance uh, prior to taking that final course that satisfies the expository writing requirement or the applied quantitative reasoning requirement. Now, in the other areas, um, areas such as calculus, physics, foreign language, or music theory, you'll just take those placement exams only if you intend to enroll in those courses. Francie, do you remember which placement exams you took before coming? Yeah, um, I took the physics and the calculus placement exams. Uh, I'd had kind of a crazy online senior year, and so I didn't really learn calculus in my senior year of high school. Um, <laughs> so I ended up placing into calculus one, but I actually really felt like that was great. I got to really build up a strong foundation of calculus skills, and I think it served me really well in the long run. I mean, here I am now, I've completed the full calculus sequence um, and I've taken other higher level math classes and I feel like I'm doing just fine. Um, for physics, I did test out of physics one, but I was off, to be honest, extremely unsure about my own physics ability and didn't, wasn't sure if that test was an accurate representation of my own ability. So I decided to enroll in physics one anyway. Um, I think I would have been fine either way. I enjoyed taking physics one because I really thought the professor was fantastic. Um, I had doc uh, Dr. Evan Halstead and he did a great job teaching that class. Um, but for physics, if you do test out of physics one, you can enroll, enroll directly into physics two in the fall, um, which would have given me a little more, more room in my schedule going through the levels, but honestly hasn't helped me back at all. I've been able to take all the classes I've wanted to each semester. Um, so. I would say if you don't test out of a level, don't feel like your world's going to end. It says nothing about your intelligence. It just says what you've learned so far. Um, and Skimmer is a great place to learn. And so that would be my advice. Great. Thank you. Another question in the Q&A is asking about study abroad. So what are the opportunities available and when do students start and how do they start those conversations? So I just want to mention a couple a couple of notes here before I turn it over to Francie. I want to hear about your, again, I would like to hear about your experience abroad last semester. Um, but we actually offer a first year experience uh, 
program abroad in London for fall term. So there are two sections of the Scrivener Seminar that take place in London. I had the opportunity to teach one of those sections in 2018. So I was there with a colleague and we had a cohort of 35 students who started their Skidmore experience in London. So students gather on campus for a brief orientation and then go over to London for that fall term and then integrate back to campus in January of their freshman year. Um, otherwise, students will tend to study abroad either in their sophomore, junior, or senior year. Sometimes even students participate in the London, London um, FYE program, and then they might study abroad again. So one of my advisees did London FYE in fall of 2022. He's currently studying in Vienna now, and he'll be back on campus this fall, and then he'll go to Melbourne, Australia next spring. So lots of opportunities. Usually your advisor will bring up study abroad to you. We're going through the advising process right now for current students to register for the fall. And so this is a regular point on my talking list with my advisees. Also the peer mentors will bring up study abroad usually in the fall term. Um, but I wanna, like I said, Francie recently studied abroad. And so Francie, do you mind sharing a little bit about your process for choosing your program and your timeline for doing so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, last semester, I studied abroad at the University of Edinburgh in Edinburgh, Scotland in the UK. Um, study abroad was always a goal for me for college. I knew that coming in, I had had family members study abroad and they really loved it. And so I was really excited that Skidmore has so many opportunities to study abroad. Um, we have over 100 approved programs that you can go on. Um, and if there is a program you want to do that isn't approved, it's just a little bit more paperwork you have to do. Um, I always tell families uh, when I give tours, I'm a tour guide. Um, if you want to go somewhere, Skidmore will find a way for you to go there. Um, so there's definitely a lot of flexibility with that. It just requires a little bit of planning. Um, I decided during my sophomore year to really start thinking about it because I knew that I probably wanted to go abroad during my junior year. I ended up having a few meetings with my physics advisor to talk about what classes I had left to take in the physics major. Um, I met with some dance faculty to talk about what courses I had left in the dance minor. I know I ended up going and having a meeting with uh, the Office of Academic Advising actually, and we went through like how everything would fit together just to make sure I wasn't leaving anything out. Um, and then I also did quite a few meetings with the Office of Study Abroad just to make sure um, I understood the whole process of applying to study abroad. They were good, really good in terms of making sure I knew all the deadlines I needed to meet uh, for my applications and what the different programs that were available were. Um, I ended up choosing my program because it would help me fulfill one of my requirements for the physics major. I needed to take a calculus class. And so I was like, you know what? I really just want to go somewhere where I can take a class in English. Um, so I ended up going to Scotland um, and I was able to fulfill that requirement. It's now on my transcript, and so I don't need to take calculus four while I'm here, which is great. Um, and also, I fulfilled while I was abroad my language requirement, my world language requirement that we have here at Skidmore. Um, so getting those out of the way left room in my schedule for now that I'm back to do um, all of the rest of the things I need to do and also some fun classes. Uh, if I hadn't been able to fulfill requirements, though, I still would have graduated on time. I just would have had a few heavier semesters coming back. Um, so I think it's definitely very doable to go abroad. I encourage everyone to at least look into it. Um, plenty of students decide not to go abroad, but plenty of students do go abroad. I think um, the statistic right now is 60% of Skidmore students go abroad during some point of their college experience. And some more than once, as we emphasize too. So I wanna shift now, Ryan, to there's been a little bit of activity about some of the unique programs that Skidmore offers for students who we don't necessarily have a major that is exactly what they want. So we have a program called Self-Determined Major, also another type of self-study, which is the self-instruction for language, foreign language. And I was wondering if you could speak about those two opportunities that we have. Yes, absolutely. And thanks, um, thanks participants for those great questions. Um, we're also going to be sharing some links to academic departments and programs so you can learn a little bit more about each of the different programs. You know, there's a couple of questions that have come through there. Um, and also the link to the list of programs um, for study abroad and travel seminar opportunities too. So be on the lookout um, for those links. And as far as the self-instructional um, language program, very cool. 
unfortunately, students can't do it in their first semester, but it's really great for you to be able to plan ahead. And that expands the, the range of foreign languages that, that we're able to offer. Um, they require, a, they're small, small courses, those self-instructional ones, and they require a lot more independent learning, um, but they're still a classroom experience. And so let me list some of the foreign languages that we offer here. American Sign Language, that's one of the self-instructional ones. Ancient Greek, Arabic, Arabic's another self-instructional one. Chinese, French, German, Hebrew, Hebrew is a self-instructional program. Italian, Japanese, Korean, um, which is a self-instructional program. Latin, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese and Russian are both self-instructional language programs. And we have Sanskrit and Spanish. Um, with the self-instructional language programs, one of the other differences is that students will take two semesters, not necessarily sequential, but, but oftentimes sequential, but you'll take two semesters in order to satisfy your um, language study requirement. Um, some programs like business also automatically require as part of built into their curriculum language courses. And many students also study more than one language. So the goal here is not necessarily to merely satisfy your language study requirement. It's really to explore these areas. Um, and very often students have an interest in more than one language. And there was another one you mentioned, uh, Rachel, the self-determined major. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I serve on this committee, the self-determined major committee, and I really enjoy doing this work with the committee. Um, it's comprised of me as an advisor and also um, three or four other faculty members, each from sort of different pockets of the college. We have someone from the sciences and someone from the humanities and someone from the social sciences and the natural sciences. So what's neat about the self-determined uh, self major is that you sort of build your own curriculum. Now that's that is quite a tall order, right? Because otherwise we have all these pre-existing majors and departments and they're fully supported and all the courses exist. So um, it's really neat when you see yourself doing something that can be supported by our faculty and the courses that we offer, but doesn't completely fit the mold of some of our pre-existing programs. So for example, in the past, um, students have gone on to do certain specialized area in media studies. So we have great programs in English and we have great programs in um, film uh, and documentary studies, but that's just a, that's just a minor. Um, so students can sometimes create something that's more like media and communications hybrid or something more geared toward the health professions. Um, one of the things that the committee looks at first and foremost, though, is whether a student couldn't be better served by a pre-existing major and minor. And that is often the case. And given the fact that all students will take so many courses outside of their major as it is, in a way, because again, we're a liberal arts college, everyone is sort of doing a self-determined major. You know, no two students will satisfy their degree requirements in exactly the same way. Um, so generally, the committee is looking for students who have already completed probably their first year of study, so they have a chance to explore a, different, a number of different areas of academic interest, and then those students who are interested, and we have about five students graduate from the SDM a year, you know, they have to do a lot of research into what we offer here at Skidmore. Um, sometimes it often includes taking courses abroad or at other institutions to sort of bolster that curriculum. Um, so they do a lot of research and at other institutions and sometimes mirror um, a, a, an existing major from another institution here at Skidmore. Great, thank you. I want to shift a little bit. There's been some questions about student life in, in the, the Q&A. And so again, the focus of the panel is on academics, but certainly there's integration between student life and academic experience on Skidmore campus. So I do want to touch on a couple of those, especially because some of them are related to transition programming. So one of the questions is about orientation activities. And so I want to give an answer, and then I'm going to invite Ryan and Francie to add to, to, to what I say. So what kind of 
of orientation activities are there to familiarize students with non-academic aspects of college life? So Francie alluded earlier to pre-orientation, which is a fantastic program that we offer prior to new student orientation. So pre-orientation is not required, but it is highly encouraged. So students would arrive on a Thursday and participate in that program until Sunday. And many of those programs will take place in the Adirondacks. So doing outdoor activities, hiking, canoeing, camping, et cetera. But we understand that the outdoors, while many of us love them, are not for everyone. And so we also have pre-orientation activities focused on campus. So one focuses on the Tang Museum, the Tang Teaching and Art Museum that we have on campus. One talks about theater. One introduces students to Saratoga. And there are many others that are set up that keep students on campus, but integrating both to campus facilities as well as the community. Then on Sunday, students will all gather together. So any students who did not participate in pre-orientation will arrive, and then everyone will meet their Scribner Seminar cohort for the first time. And the peer mentor, so Francie did this role a couple of years ago, will serve as the orientation leader. So the first day is focused on getting used to campus, getting in touch with your residence life. So your residence life components, who are the people that you're living with? What does that community look like? We also have an introductory a convocation. So this official kickoff of the academic year, then students are being introduced to campus policies, building community with each other, as well as getting prepared for the first day of classes. So students will also meet their Scribner seminar professor. So many of them will have had some interaction as an advisor over the summer, but they'll meet their class for the first time on that Tuesday during orientation. Then in addition to the, the sort of scheduled and task oriented programming, there are social activities as well. So we have a DJ, we have an ice cream party, movies, lots of opportunities for students to interact and get to know each other. Many of those interactions are based on Scribner seminar cohort, or often students will reunite with their pre-O cohort or develop new communities within their res life community. So Francie, do you want to add to anything there? Francie is also an RA. So Francie serves lots of roles on, on campus and can certainly talk about what goes on in orientation. Yeah, I mean, one of the things to highlight from like the RA aspect is we have a special meeting for all first years on the floor before other students get there. That's a great opportunity to kind of get your eyes on who else is in your year and is living with you in your, your building. Um, all of the RAs uh, then are helping to walk their students over to the ice cream social on that first night. That's a great opportunity for all of the students to meet each other in a non-academic setting. And um, all of I really encourage everyone to just try and go to all of those events, even if you're not feeling a movie that particular night. Um, just going and being around other people. Everyone's in the same boat as you. Nobody knows really anybody else. Um, and so that's a great opportunity to make new friends and meet new people. Um, and I think just overall, the whole vibe of that few days of orientation is just trying to meet new people, make connections. Um, everyone is feeling similar to you, nervous about college, um, nervous about meeting new people. And so that's, I think, a great time to make connections with people. And those connections grow and change over the years you're at college. I know that some of the friends I made during my first week, we just say hi to each other on campus anymore. We're not as good friends, but some friends are some of the closest people that I know on campus today. And I go and see them all the time. We eat meals together. Um, I'm living with one of them next year. So there's definitely a wide range in the relationships you have with people. Um, I just encourage people to go and do things. That's the best way to meet people. Francie, related to that, do you mind to comment on what students do on the weekends? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's one of the best things about Skidmore is there is just so much to do on campus. I mean, there's more events than there are students every year on campus. We have over 3,000 events every year and about 2,700 students. So that really gives you an idea of just how many things are going on. Um, on Thursday nights, an event I really love is Lively Lucy's um, that's held out in fall staffs. Every Thursday night, uh, they bring in different bands from campus, uh, different uh, indie bands also from upstate New York will come in and play shows. 
um, it's a really great opportunity to just kind of like unwind from the week, let go of some of the stress before you do the last weekday of Friday. Um, but also I have so many friends that are so talented. I love on weekends going to see them perform in acapella showcases, um, going to see them in theater shows, going to be, be in dance shows and go and see people in dance shows. Um, everyone's really supportive of each other. Um, and also so many of my friends have so many different interests. They're like keyed into all the different events that are going on on campus. So a lot of times I'll get events like, do you want to come and do this uh, leaf printing uh, activity that's being held at our idea lab, our makerspace on campus? Or, um, hey, there's going to be a cool uh, event about a book that you and I really like being held at the library. We should go to that. And so I think that's awesome. I will also say Saratoga is a fantastic um, place to be on the weekends. It's a gorgeous city. Um, there is so much to do downtown, wonderful shopping, wonderful things to eat. So I definitely spend a lot of time down there. Um, my friends and I love walking down and getting on Common Ground, which is the student favorite coffee shop. Um, and that's really fun. I love catching up with people on the weekends. I'm a super busy student during the week. So sometimes I, the only time I have to catch up with a friend is on a Saturday morning. And so we spend a lot of time together. Um, so that's great. I think all Skidmore students are really engaged in what they're doing. So that opens a lot of avenues for things to do at all times of day. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about research and internships. So students won't necessarily have those opportunities their first semester, but as early as the, the spring semester, you may engage in research with a faculty member. So Francie, that's when we worked on our research project, right? Um, and I have her doing some research with me now. So many Skidmore students will engage in research at some point during their four years on campus, either with a faculty member doing a one credit research experience or perhaps do through a more immersive summer research program, which can vary from five to 10 weeks. So we have a lot of research opportunities in the summer where students get room and board and get a stipend to work with a faculty member. And that's that's available for students in the sciences, but also in the humanities and the arts. So there are a lot of different opportunities for students to work with a faculty member on their scholarship, regardless of what that scholarship might be. Um, Francie, you've had a couple of research experiences. Like I mentioned, you've done research with me, you've done research in physics, and you've had a couple of exciting summer research positions. Do you mind to talk a little bit about those experiences? Sure, absolutely. Um, so like Dr. Rodale mentioned, I did research with her during my first semester. That was like a smaller project to kind of dip my toes into what research might look like. Um, and I found out I liked it. Um, and so then I went on after kind of taking a few more classes in the physics department and realizing I really was interested in some physics research. I did a one semester research uh, class with a professor who focused in particle physics. And so he taught me a lot about the basics of particle physics um, and how he had worked uh, in collaboration with the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. So. He had a lot of information about that and had done a lot of analysis of data for that. So I got to recreate some of his analyses, um, read his dissertation. Um, he gave me some textbooks to read and that was a really great opportunity to get to know a topic that I wasn't taking a class on and we don't offer a class in at Skidmore, um, but it was awesome. I learned so much from that semester. Um, right now I'm currently working uh, with Dr. Mary Odekon uh, in her, uh, galaxy structure lab so that is a astrophysics cosmology lab that is super fun it's a huge group um and by huge i mean it's 10 people um but <laughs> that's big for the physics department and that's really great because we're able to kind of split up into different areas and do research in different areas um right now the subgroup that i'm in is looking into the mass of different galaxies in order to explore um dark matter in the universe so that is really cool. And I just started working in that lab this semester. So that's been really fun to kind of learn about everything, kind of figure out what I wanna do for my senior research next year as a physics major, um, learn how to take over a program from a, a project from a graduating senior this year. So that's been great. Um, I will say last summer, I did a summer research experience at Cornell. Uh, it was fantastic. It, it was part of an NSF funded um, it is an NSF funded project uh, called the REU, a research experience for undergraduates. 
those programs really look to take students who come from schools like Skidmore, students that are highly motivated but don't have access to all of the bells and whistles that come with going to a huge R1 research institution. I've loved the research I've gotten to do at Skidmore, but Cornell had a lot of instruments that we just don't have access to as a smaller institution. So it's great to bring some of the skills that I've learned at Skidmore, um, like all of the skills I've learned in reading academic journals and some of the skills I've learned in coding and um, just general understanding of physics and apply it to high level research like that. And so that was an awesome experience and really like opened my eyes to um, different future opportunities for me. I think I'm still not sure what I want to do after college, but that summer really opened my eyes to the potential of doing a PhD in physics. I hadn't really even thought that I could do that. And so that summer really sold me on that. Um, and then I'm doing a similar project this summer um, in Switzerland at CERN, which is uh, the uh, Large Hadron Collider, the organization that my professor worked at and had taught me all about last year. So I'm really excited to get to apply everything I learned at Skidmore at that into an actual setting um, and do work there. Thank you, Francie. So we have a little bit of time left for a few more questions. So if, if you have any, any questions that you would like answered, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm going to turn to Ryan, though, and to talk a little bit about double majors. So some of the students want to know about the process for declaring two majors, as well as the possibility for having a single course being able to count for both majors. Oh, those are such great questions, and uh, it, I'm, I'm glad um, they're getting raised because I think I forgot to mention earlier just what the process is to actually declare a major. So <laughs> the process of declaring a major is really easy. You just complete a form, and uh, you have your new advisor from your new program of study sign off to be your new academic advisor, and then you get more um, increased opportunities to, for that kind of mentorship and guidance um, and get more aware of the different kind of research opportunities that Francie was talking about as well. So yes, you can declare two majors or a major and a minor and um, many courses that you take will sort of double dip or even triple dip um, so to speak across your degree requirements so for example many of you might take um, an expository writing course in your first semester and if you take EN 105 for example that course satisfies the expository writing requirement but it does not even though it comes from the English department, it doesn't satisfy a, a requirement if you were to become a, a major or a minor in English. Now, on the other hand, if you took EN 110, that's a course that both satisfies the all college requirement in expository writing, but also satisf satisfies a requirement for the major or a minor if you were an English major or a minor. Now, then there's a certain maximum number of courses that can be applied across two majors or across a major and a minor. Um, do you know, Rachel, what that is off the top of your head? Because that's one of the things I meant to look up. It's not, I, I can't remember. The maximum but across a major and a minor is or, two. Or, or across a major and a minor. Yeah, two majors is, or is three courses <laughs> that could count for both. I see this three. Um, I'm almost four. positive. I'm like 98% yeah. sure now that it's being recorded yeah. and everyone will hold me to it. I um, know. But, Look but, at us. But, there is, but we definitely have courses and, and physics and math are a great combination. So because so much math is involved for physics, we often get students who will double major. And so, for example, Francie had to take calculus three and calculus four. Both of those are also required for the, the math major and the physics major. And so they would certainly count in both cases. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, other common pairings are management and business major with an economics major or minor. But I also want to say that there's probably as many uncommon pairings. Um, and, and generally speaking, there's enough time and room um, in students' schedules over the course of four years. To, to do more than one major. Now, on the other hand, from an advising perspective, we very often see students come in who want to, you know, quadruple major and triple conundrum minor. So you'll learn as you go through, like really where you want to focus. Um, and sometimes that may mean doing a double major and, and a minor, and sometimes it, it won't. You'll find that you're actually able to do everything that you want to do and dive deep um, within the course of one major. Because you're, you're, everyone's going to be doing 120 credits 
Everyone's going to be doing 24 maturity level, advanced level um, courses. So it's it's very, very robust, no matter how, um, no, no matter, you know, the major or the minor is essential and important, but it's it's one piece of a larger degree. Great, thank you. So that actually brings us right to time. So I just want to finish with a question that we hit at part of it earlier, talking about the class experience, um, but just how do we draw out student interest? And I think lots of the opportunities that the panel has mentioned tonight. So getting to know students in a small environment, a small class environment, the advising model, as well as research and engaging across a lot of different activities. So you really have the opportunity for faculty to get to know students and for students to really be heard and seen in their courses. So I want to thank the panelists for being here tonight with me. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us that feel free to reach out to us individually if you have additional questions that weren't answered tonight. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. We Just a few reminders, we want to make sure that you continue to check your email and that you schedule a meeting with your financial aid counselor if necessary, follow up with Skidmore admissions if you have questions definitely check your admissions portal. And you can also find us on Discord's class of 2028 channel. So we have a couple of current peer mentors from this year's cohort who are moderating that venue and are happy to answer your questions there. Finally, I just wanna add that Janessa will add a link for upcoming events in the Zoom chat, and we look forward to seeing you virtually or on campus. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night, everybody. Good night, see you soon.